Hey, good evening, everyone. Good evening, welcome. I am Cecilia Wickman. I'm an associate curator of contemporary art here at the BMA. And my co-curators, Jessica Bell Brown and Leela Grothy, and I are thrilled to welcome you tonight with immense excitement as we kick off a new series at the BMA. This series is Risk-Taking Women in the Arts. And we're thrilled to gather in connection with Martha Jackson Jarvis's breathtaking exhibition, What the Trees Have Seen, which is in the contemporary wing. <clears throat> and um, we hope you'll see it tonight and then again and again while it's on view through October 1st. So tonight is the first in three discussions sponsored by Deborah Buck Foundation which is an organization supporting institutions that are actively working to reverse the marginalization of women in the fine arts. This series is dedicated to the loving memory of Sue Dalsimer, Deborah Buck's mother, longtime friend and supporter of the Baltimore Museum of Art. And we thank you, Deborah, for choosing to honor your mother in this way. Yes. This evening, we gather for a meeting of the minds between two artists who we most deeply revere, Martha Jackson Jarvis and Elisa Blount Moorhead. What is about to unfold live is their conversation with us here at the edge of our seats, present and listening in. Martha and Elisa are luminaries with decades of discipline-spanning work and experience between them. Martha, nearly 50 years, most often in the practice of sculpture, and Elisa, over 30 years in the realm of film and expanded media. <clears throat> so, um, rather than siphon any time that can be spent listening and learning from their exchange, what I wanna do is simply direct you to their websites, marthajacksonjarvis.com and elisablountmoorhead.com, where you can spend more time after this evening's program. So before we welcome them to the stage, let me just say that you're all invited to join us after this conversation uh, for a light reception. We'll have a light reception in Fox Court. Um, and then most importantly, above all, to experience Martha Jackson Jarvis's astonishing What the Trees Have Seen in the Contemporary Wing. Please join me in welcoming Martha and Elisa to the stage. How about now? All right. I can't see. I always look for my friends, so I feel comfortable. <laughs> oh, hi. I see. I see two of them. I feel better already. Um, Hello. Hi. hi. <laughs> I'm so honored and humbled and, and astounded to be um, sitting next to you. <laughs> and sharing space with you. I'm just, you know, grateful to Cecilia and Jessica for their incredible work and Absolutely. thoughtfulness always, and, um, you know, for bringing us together. Yes. So. It's an, it is my honor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I just want to first start with um, a land acknowledgement. We are here on uh, Piscataway and Lumbee land. We may be, maybe more, especially because we're gonna spend time talking about practices that relate to land and earth. Yes. And um, you know, this is of course contested land and I want to uh, give thanks and praise for what their ancestors brought and, um, and to acknowledge uh, their rituals, their elders that are still here and, the, um, and their ancestors. And I also want to give an acknowledgement to our shared ancestors who, um, under duress, built this country and still contributed um, everything we needed to make art and to understand art and to uh, be who we are. So um, just wanted to acknowledge that. So, all right, let's start. <laughs> I've had to make some notes because um, I wonder how many people have gotten a chance to see Martha's work here. 
oh my God, what a treat you are in for. <laughs> it's so incredible. And, and what um, I, I brought some slides just because I was thinking about it and um, I came with my daughter and had to tear her out of here because <laughs> she, she wanted to spend all day with the work. And I realized this is just a small fraction of your practice um, and your work. And so I thought I would share some slides that particularly focused on work that you'd have to see out in the world mm -hmm. because they'll be able to see this work here. So if that's okay, yeah, that's then maybe we can share some of that work. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'd like to start with um, at the beginning. Okay. Um, that y you came from Lynchburg um, and that uh, <laughs> you were sort of a, a Forrest Gump character. You were in all the right places at all the important times because you moved from there to then D.C. in the early 70s. And this is uh, the D.C. of Donny Hathaway and as we were talking about in yeah. H.U.R. and yeah. Sweet Honey in the Rock and Elizabeth Catlett. And I mean, really an astounding time to show up at Howard, then on to Philadelphia and... and um, back to Washington. And so I really want to understand from you wh how those cities in particular and spaces in particular informed your work. Yeah. Well, um, place and space has always been really important to me. And of course, you talked about, um, uh, I was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, um, and had the opportunity to spend time there being raised by my grandparents then. And for me, it was an extraordinary time because I often say in the 50s, young children's every moment was not curated. Mm -hmm. You had, you could wander and explore in the forest and meet up with a, 10 of your cousins and go out in the woods and spend the day at the spring and collecting and foraging. So I think from that experience, I gained an extraordinary um, love and sensibility to the materials around me that early on I realized that I was not alone in the planet, on the planet, that there was all this extraordinary energy. And I think that's the word that has woven its way through my work over the years, the energy of entering the forest, the energy of seeing a, uh, the spring or the water coming from the mountains um, was important and it stayed with me. And I left Virginia and moved a part of the great migration, you know, out of the mm -hmm. South. My family moved from Virginia to Philadelphia, you know, this kind of straight line, you know, the, um, historically there. and. For me, country city, never the suburbs. <laughs> but um, when I reached uh, Philadelphia, I was then 13 years old. So, you know, it's just exploring things. But what was extraordinary that my mother exposed my sister and I to the museums and the theater and the symphony and the opera, and I was like, oh my God, who knew that these things existed? So it was this dichotomy that I was caught between. And then, of course, I found my way to a museum. And just to um, see, you know, the possibilities of what thinkers and creative people had thought, and, and that somehow I felt a part, I felt a kinship that seemed to stay with me. Did you, did you think then um, that you would be an artist or did you think this is just something I need to be near? Well, or? you know, for art, I, it was something I did in secret, really. You know, mm. I did it in private. I would do it in my room or, you know, if walking in the forest, you could assemble and do all these kinds of things, uh, playing with rocks and stones, always gathering materials. So. Early on, I think that stayed. And then I had the, um, I guess I was in high school and I had to, I stumbled into what was the art room and there was a bag of clay in the back of this room. And I like opened it and I was like, ooh, I know this material. It's like 
going to the spring and there's all this clay. Well, who you know the red clay of Virginia is just rich and fantastic. And I found, I refound that material and it refound me and I just started. I went home and I was really steadfast. I had practiced what I was gonna to say to my mother. I am gonna be an artist. And she looked at me, she said, okay, you just have to take care of yourself. <laughs> So I turned around, I was like, now what? I have to be an artist, so I'm an artist, yeah. That's incredible that there was a, that, that was a declaration because yeah. that would have been unusual for a black child at that time to say that's what I'm gonna be, not a teacher or, or a doctor or whatever no, things were expected. Not a teacher, not a doctor, but an artist to do these things, to work with these materials and I didn't know what else to call it. I don't know if I had the facility to really claim all that being an artist entailed. I just knew that somehow the creativity had to be there. But I also, my mother was an extraordinary, uh, talented painter and she would draw and she made the most beautiful, she was a seamstress, she made the most beautiful clothing. So my sister and I were always regaled in these pinafores and fancy things as I walked in the forest, right? Uh, it, I'm sure she was okay. happy about that. Right. So, uh, and my sister always managed to keep her socks clean and of course I would like have mud all up the leg by the time I got home. So it was part of a creative source. And you, and I remember reading you had a grandfather that also let you participate with materials, right? Yes, my grandfather in, in the country. Um, I think he got a kick out of that a little girl would like to follow him around. I loved following him because he had a tool shed, you know, and you'd open up this shed and he'd have all these tools, you know, categorized. It's a studio. It's a studio, I mean, and I love that. And I think he enjoyed that as a little girl, he would always give me the tips of how to hammer and out hammer my boy cousins and how to get it done. And that stuck with me, you know, that you just have to do it, you know. And um, he never made like a difference that I couldn't do something. It was always, you can do this, just do it. Or, you know, I could get on the tractor and ride with him or something. It was nice. <laughs> Early feminist. Early. <laughs> So I, I want to point to, speaking of, you know, origins, um, this piece, um, and was wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about, well, this series, but this yeah. piece in particular. This was um, a, a series that was called Ancestors' Bones. And what's interesting is that this photograph, I was, um, when I was 19, just a few years ago, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I was, um, I used to go to, in Philadelphia, they had extraordinary junk shops, you know, secondhand shops. And I was always foraging, finding things and materials. And I found this old photo album. It was worn and the cover was torn off. And of photographs, it was a, obviously, you know, a family photograph that someone had just turned in. And of course, in the front of the book, there were all these beautiful black and whites, you know, and it was of uh, a, a white family, you know, and as you move through, the, the pages were like crumbling and the photographs were still intact. As I got near the rear of the album, there were all these African-American people, black people in the book. And this image, this is one of the photographs, and I took those, well, it took me years. I kept that album with me for at least another 20 years, right? And when I traveled, I kept it and I didn't know, I knew it was a resource, I just didn't feel uh, that I could manage the material at that point. Um, so at this point I did an exhibition that was at the University of Delaware, their museum, and it was called Ancestors Bones. And from this photograph, I thought it was so extraordinary because it just reminded me of my great grandmother kind of sitting, who was like the, the matriarch of the family, and there she is, like holding court mm. on this extraordinary kind of, um, really, the environment. Uh, and this photograph, to me, spoke about um, claiming one's space, right? 
it isn't uh, you know, a, a space that one would say, well, this is just a fabulous house, but she sits on it like a throne. But it is her space, she commands it. Uh, she's obviously the elder, and I thought this photograph was so telling because there was uh, a young woman who's facing and looking at us. This, it, you can't see it so much in this photograph, but in the photograph, she's really eye contact you know, with whoever's taken this photograph. And you can see that she's a, a mixed race mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. right? And then I was also struck with the animals because these are like really uh, old hunting dogs. They're so svelte and healthy and <laughs> they all stand ready. And they know not to walk up on that porch. They stand down mm -hmm. and they stand at guard because she's holding and commanding the space. So there's something about the magic of commanding space. And, and this Ancestors Bones, I started to compare some of the old illustrations of choral works uh, mm -hmm. from um, uh, Saba, uh, at the turn of the century, just kind of collecting things in the world and how, how we view the materials. And I started to uh, collect these drawings of um, coral, because I related that this coral in the middle passage that all of the many thousands gone, that the bones had not disappeared, but the calcium, the carbon, it had gone into the sea and indeed become a part of the living coral. So for me, it becomes, became symbolic in kind of layering the bones, that it wasn't just part of the sea, but also part of the legacy of uh, the crossing, the middle passage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's long-winded, but there we go. <laughs> Not at all. Okay. Um, and, you know, and, and again, sort of thinking about making these frames that, that talk about ancestral, um, you know, ideas around what becomes of the body, what becomes of the space. Um, you know, I think it's, I had a teacher at Parsons who said, um, Artists think they're doing a lot of different things, but they're only really doing one thing. <laughs> yeah. And that they're really pursuing something, one thing. Their whole, and that in equal parts um, excited me and terrified me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure I know, I think, I think a lot about um, mundanity because it feels like a, a luxury when you're in contested spaces and I, grew up in what we talked about, a very safe space in the Chocolate City, and so I got to spend a lot of time in the quotidian. So I think that's sort of one of my one things. And I'm curious, I've made a lot of guesses about what your one thing is. <laughs> um, and if you had to say that it was, there was a one thing, if we believe that, um, what do you think that is? Yeah, the one thing. I think the one thing is about um, energy that, um, extraordinary oneness of life, of living things, living materials, of us, you know, that it, there's a, a thread that weaves its way through. And I guess I'm really intrigued with how we encounter this energy, whether it's in space, the materials. Um, I think that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah that's I'm my one try, thing. I'm gonna try to use this properly, let's see if I do. <laughs> oh yeah, so um, I had the great privilege of moving to DC when I was young and sort of um, being able to grow up in a space that's an interesting city in that it's a green, very green city, you mm -hmm. know, or it was anyway, and you know, growing up in Rock Creek Park in that red mud. <laughs> yeah. And um, this uh, piece, which I love so much, um, is cited at Van Ness, right? Which, yes. speaking of mundanity, is a pretty unremarkable site, right? A lot of brutalist architecture, it's a grocery store that we grew up going to. Um, and you have made it into something that I don't, I can't imagine, I couldn't have imagined as a kid. And I, I always think like, what would this have been like if I could have played out here instead of screaming for my mother to get out of the grocery store? Right. Um, and I'm really intrigued by both the, the work, the, the um, content of the um, materials, materiality, but also the, um, 
the movement, the co cosmology sort of feeling mm -hmm. um, a around it. I don't know why it makes me think of Dogon and that sort of um, you know idea, but also the uh, sound connection and the name struck me because I was like, there is an actual sort of sound that changes when you move around this space. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear you talk a little yeah. bit about this piece and um, the name of the piece. Yeah, the name of the piece is Music of the Spheres. And it is sited in Washington, D.C. at Van Ness. This plaza, which is, um, the plaza belonged to Fannie Mae at the time. They owned it. Mm -hmm. It was one of their headquarters. And the next door, it was the University of Distri District of Columbia. So most people think it belongs to UDC. But it's really, it was commissioned by uh, Fannie Mae. And you described the brutalist kind of architecture and the space. It's a transitional space. It's also like outside of the, the metro. The metro was just kind of being built at this time and um, the stations weren't quite all finalized. So I wanted to create, um, to take a space that's just, there's kind of nothing there, you know? but to somehow introduce, again, when I talk about energy and placement of materials, I wanted to introduce materials that you would not encounter normally, just on the street corner. Uh, on the, the first uh, sphere um, is constructed of carnelian stone, so there, of course, it's like a steel in the core, then the concrete, and then I'm hand-setting carnelian stones, which I had quarried in, India and shipped. And so each stone is, is hand set and placed in the carnelian stone. The blue stone is a mixture of um, Italian glass tessera. And then the greenish stone is a, a very uh, beautiful natural um, Indonesian jade stone. And it's a natural stone. It's usually, you know, formed in water. So it has this wonderful rounded and of course the coloration of water itself. So the whole idea was that to introduce a sensory experience in a place that was just barren. It's just concrete, steel, and glass, right? You come up out of the subway and it's just nothing, right? So um, I, for me, the moment that I realized that this piece was really successful, I had just finished like putting the final top on, I think the, the um, the blue sphere and I'm climbing down, I'm hearing this tapping on the other side of the sphere and I'm getting down off the ladder to see what the heck is going on. And there was a, a, a blind gentleman and he was standing there and he had someone with it. He said, and I said, well, he said, oh, um, he had brought, he was blind, he could not see. There was, um, he went to a class there and he said he got off the bus He's done this many times, and of course there were no spheres. Well, after we did the installation, what? There were all these spheres there that he had to encounter and experience. And he said, I miss, you made me miss my class because I spent the whole day just feeling and walking around to experience these things. So that day, he had brought a sighted friend. I, he said, I brought my friend because she had to see this. And I thought, my work here is done. I mean, I, you know that. And it is. Me. It makes sense because it, it, there is an aural kind of sensation as well being between them. And I don't know if that was planned. I know that you know music factors a lot into your work and sound, and but it does do something you know in the space. That, and I mean, I imagine in particular if you're sensitive to sound, um, or you're you know you favor a different uh, sense. Yeah. that you would perceive that. Right. And of course, conceptually, you know, the music of the spheres, there's no sound in space. So it's this contradiction of life and science and all of these things. And of course, at the base of it, it's, you know, we're still talking about science and the myth of what is real and what isn't. And um, I think art can teeter right on the edge of that. And I like to kind of skirt that edge. Yeah. Um. It's an incredible piece, and I, and you, you spend uh, a bit of time talking about and thinking about science and math. I don't know, is that sort of um, on the outset, or is that you make the forms and then it becomes that, or 
Um, is that part of your practice? Is that investigation around oh, sort of science? And, oh, absolutely. Aside from nature is the obvious. Y no. Yes, yes. It's all connected, so it's, you can't really separate it. So within doing the research or the idea for a piece to bring it into fruition, you have to kind of skirt along you know, a lot of the, the, the corridors of how things begin to overlap. And I think it's those synaptic points where things start to cross, then it isn't fully this or it isn't fully that, yeah. but somehow it has the essence of many things. Yeah. Um, well, this piece is, is this um, called umbilical? Is that the full? Umbilicus. Mm -hmm. Umbilicus is the piece. Um, would you talk a little bit about this piece and, and, and also moving between a studio practice, uh, public art practice, um, sculpture, paper. I mean, you sort of have this fluidity through different medium, different um, contexts. And, you know, I was wondering what was the impetus for this series in particular in this work? Yeah, um, this is um, umbilicus, we said. And again, uh, the forest, like forage out, and I still collect these vines. I love it that it's kind of growing and grows over things, and if you stand there long enough, it'll grow over you. So, <laughs> and so there's something about the energy of life just wanting to just continue no matter what. Um, so I collect these things and dry them in the studio, and so they're always there in terms of, uh, I almost see it as like, you know, drawing in space, you know, like the, the form, the, the plant itself is moving, and whatever space it's claiming or reclaiming, you know, it's evident in the form itself. So with that umbilicus, I, I really started to think about, this is a, um, a stone that's really a, mm, a volcanic kind of stone, so it's kind of light and fluffy. And of course, the base of this is metal, uh, internal structure, and then concrete, and then it's an additive piece by piece, stone by stone, to build these things out. Uh, I was struck with um, the notion of uh, the umbilicus, this uh, unending uh, connection of things, and that the two things don't have to be so similar, but they are born of each other. Uh, and I have to say that this kind of came in a time, um, I have a family, and you know, children and all of those things that she has four of them. <laughs> and that, that, that yes. I, we have to have a separate conversation about how you've managed <laughs> that. that. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So you know, it was uh, a moment of um, telling. You know, um, I have a, three daughters and a son, and it was. I remember. Okay, I have three daughters first. No, I had two daughters first. Then I had a son. Then I had the last daughter. <laughs> But I was, when I had three, the daughters, it was interesting, that was wonderful, of course, and magical. But the moment that I delivered a male, and I'm like, geez, look at that. Right. Okay. I can relate. I missed the health class, because I was in art class. So, so the notion that, you know, my little body could produce a male, you know, and I just remember, it. <laughs> my husband's like, get over it, Martha. Yes, it's, it's okay. <laughs> so I created Umbilicus just to announce to the world <laughs> that this extraordinary thing had happened. Right? So Umbilicus. <laughs> I, love, I love that. It is, it is a miraculous it's thing. A miraculous I, thing. I delivered a son as well into a family of Amazons and and I remember the first time I, I changed his diaper, all of his cousins were around and they said, what is that? And um, I said, oh, well that's you know where he makes pee pee and blah, blah, blah. And my daughter said, oh, his boy vagina, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we all said, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yep. what it is. Yep. Keep moving. <laughs> yeah, because it's different. <laughs> it's different. It is different. <laughs> and in the context of us. Um, so I went to Duke Ellington School of the Arts, and oh. um, <laughs> yeah, and then actually it was still in a warehouse, um, and we used to go to Tech yes. for for the morning, where Sam Gilliam 
um, taught before, well before I was there, but um, I was so excited to see this, uh, this piece and, um, and the fact that it has this sort of um, kind of mentoring um, intention, mm -hmm. you know, behind it. There's something that, that's, that's there that talks about, you know, your potential when yes. you leave the school. And just wondering if you would talk, Duke Ellington, sorry, is the School of the Arts in Washington, if you don't know. Um, and I was wondering if you would talk just briefly yeah. about this one. Uh, when I left um, Philadelphia for the second time and came back to, moved back to Washington, I started teaching at Duke Ellington School of the Arts and I taught there a couple of years and then, you know, moved on. And then my youngest daughter, Ingina, whom I collaborate with, um, went to Duke Ellington and graduated. And then we created collaboratively this piece for Duke Ellington School. Um, Peggy Cooper Caferts, who was one of the founders of the original. Our, our patron saint. <laughs> yes, patron saint of the arts. Um, I was at um, a dinner party and she saw me from across the room and I said, oh, I'm in trouble. I know she's coming over here and I'm going to look this way. And then she said, you know, there's a grant we can get. There's like, you can get half the grant and then you can build something for the school and you can, it's, and the only thing is the deadline is tomorrow. Yes, today. <laughs> so, and I said, oh, no, no. So then I went home. I stayed up that night. I wrote the proposal. We came up with the design, I sent it in, and we got it, and, and Gina and I built this. It was, um, uh, it really talks about the, the call, keep, keep stepping. We used um, this um, African walking stick, right? There's an African proverb that you, in walking, you either use it to walk and support yourself or to kill a lion if you need to. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, uh, using that walking stick that it is called keep stepping. So to remind the young people to just keep stepping, your dreams will come true as an artist, but it's about cumulative work, direction. And I wanted it to, and Gina and I wanted it, to have the feel of the energy of, but not using the cliche of having a saxophone or a trumpet or something, mm -hmm. but we really worked on uh, this is aluminum, and we worked on really building a finite patina that we could really get this kind of surface mm. of being an instrument without yeah. being so literal. Mm -hmm. And this is with aluminum and uh, glass. The blue, the, the cobalt blue there is a beautiful uh, Italian tessera that mm. we've inset into the aluminum. And it just kind of yeah. scales the exterior the side of the building. Of the building. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, it's interesting because you talked about teaching. And I went back after Ellington and taught. And, and growing up in D.C., you know, like I said, there was the Jeff Donaldson, Ed Love. Um, you know, just I felt like everywhere, mm -hmm. you, every corner, every, every coming out of every speaker, there were artists. And, and um, you know, talking about that, that proclaiming being an artist and owning that. Yeah. It was so easy, you know, I, I, I feel <laughs> like very privileged that it was so easy because it, it seemed like a viable thing yeah. to do. Well, I have to say when I reached, <clears throat> came to Howard University in 1970, it was extraordinary because it was the first time I had been around to just walk into that fine art building and just feel the energy and then to meet people who just really thought this was the life calling, right? Who took it seriously, who said things like, you know, this, this matters, you know? You, you, you have to work to the point where, you know, it, the world has to know, have to see, you have to be direct in what you want to speak about, what you want the work to stand for. And I met serious-minded people, you know, and there were people coming all the time, not just the faculty that was there, like you name Ed Love, and Jeff Donaldson was coming at that time from Chicago with Afro-Cobra. Uh, Lois May Lou Jones was there and working. Uh, Elizabeth Catley was coming in from Mexico. Uh, Charles White, they were all come. Uh, um, 
Murray the Pillars, uh, Huey Lee Smith was the artist in residence from New York, Skunda Bogassian had come from Ethiopia. So this was just, uh, it was like an anthill <laughs> of activity, you know. And Some music the, as well. Music. music. The musicians um, were all there. Everybody. And I, you know, it, it makes me wonder because when I think about it, um, all of those people were also teachers. So Elizabeth yes. Catlett, yes, we know her work, but she was a master teacher. That's right. And, um, and, and Sam Gilliam was teaching at, at a high school. Sam Gilliam. I mean, imagine walking into a high school now and, and the equivalent of um, Sam Gilliam is there. And I wonder, you know, and worry that um, there is not necessarily that practice or that um, impetus to go back and teach in, in a specific way. And, and when I went to Ellington, every single one of my teachers was a practicing artist. Yeah. And we would go to their shows after school. We were in school all night, all the time. And then we would go to people's shows or go to people's performances. Um, you know, they taught the students how to write grants to board mm -hmm. the school. We would, we would have something that came up and they'd say, well, you're not working this summer, you're coming back here to work because we all need to keep the school going and that sort of thing. And, yeah. you know, I just, um, you know, I'm concerned about the sort of bifurcation of the profession of teaching and the profession of making and that, um, and how, you know, I wonder about people being able to benefit from being in, in a room with someone who's practicing, actively practicing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's super important and, you know, just what, what a blessing, you know, to be able to come to Howard at that time. Yeah, you know, it, it was. Um, and they worked in the community as well because I learned from them as well. So again, they didn't feel like they had to be there just at the Mecca yeah. as it's called, but also in community working mm -hmm. and, and teaching. Yeah, and there's a generosity uh, among artists. It, it really is. I mean, mm -hmm. you mentioned Sam Gilliam. I mean, um, there's a community around artists and how we lived. And um, I don't know, the poet Carol Bean is here and her husband, Michael Platt, and their home was always open and young artists was working there and apprenticing and staying over and all those things. And Sam, uh, generosity spread around the city. Yeah. You know, he, you know, I think at one point he taught at the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. but he was all over, you know. Yeah. But, you know, the generosity, you know, expanded. And yeah. uh, I remember I had a, uh, an open studio, I think in the building I'm still in now, and in walks Sam and he comes in, he says, oh, when he comes in, it's like turns the place out, right? But, um, just the energy, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and still managing other all kinds of lives. Um, my sister is best friends with Jeff's daughter. You know, he have to make us pancakes in the morning. You know, he, they 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 still managed life. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember reading Elizabeth Catlett saying, um, someone said, "How could you possibly be such?" an accomplished painter, thinker, teacher, traveler. How are you all of these things? You have children. Um, her son, Francisco Mora, played with Sun Ra, speaking okay. of Philadelphia. You know, how, how is this possible? And she said, oh, it's easy, just marry a feminist, <laughs> right? But, but her, and the feminist she married was Francisco Mora, the mm -hmm. painter. Mm -hmm. So I would add a feminist and an artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because you sort of just live, like you said, in this sort of circular way. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that uh, you can't maintain your practice in a silo yeah. and your work in a silo. And speaking of which, um, you just mentioned Carol Bean, and if anybody hasn't got a chance to see the show, please pay attention to the audio that's connected to the show, yeah, which is absolutely. also mind-blowing. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, just on Elizabeth Catlett, she, um, she had her son, she sent her son to um, study and the fine arts there, and I just remember he, he came, and he was such energy. And this is Francisco. Yes. And well, we we all kind of went home. Well, that all the professors went home for the evening. Well, when he came back in the morning, he had painted the entire corridor <laughs> of, the, of the school. And he was like, it was wonderful. <laughs> you know, he'd done the Diego Rivera all oh, wow. across the entire 
second floor. Oh my God. Yes, without permission. <laughs> and so, so. How old was he? Uh, well, he was a student. I mean, he okay. came to matri matriculate there. Uh -huh. I can't say the word. And um, it was just oh, so interesting. Oh, he was at Howard at He was time. at, yeah. Okay, okay. He had just come as a student, but he was going to give this great gift to the department, right? <laughs> unsolicited. So, unsolicited. So they had this big meeting with all the students to explain as to why this was inappropriate and that you could not go down to the National Gallery and just paint a mural on it. So he had to be reprimanded and they did paint it out. He had to paint it out. It's, you know, I mean, yeah. look what he came from. Right? Exactly. I, I, was in, I was actually in Cuba with Francisca. Um, we went on a program together to study um, dance and drum because he, he drums. Um, yes. He's he's a wild character. No, he's wild. <laughs> he remains. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, that's a, that's incredible. I'm mad they painted over it. Yeah, they did. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to. I don't know if people will recognize these shots, but these are from um, Daughters of the Dust. Oh. So I'm now connecting you to <laughs> my world in film, and um, I don't know how many people know that. You worked in the art department, or you were, you were the art department, probably. Um, no, you and people. Carrie, maybe? Mm -hmm. Carrie, Carrie James, James Marshall. Marshall. Carrie was like the, the head artist. Mm -hmm. Carrie James Marshall and Michael Kelly Williams. Oh. Out of New York. Awesome. And then, yep, and I worked on it. So, so, what it, so were you creating sets or objects? Uh, working on the sets, uh, I, I think they in invited me particularly to work on Nana Pizant's her, the bedroom, the interior, what her interior space would look like. And of course, you know me, I just <laughs> brought in a lot of stuff and it was really full. And Carrie came in and said, it's too much, they can't act in front of all of it. <laughs> so they started to just take things away. You know, once I do some build it, they start, you know, next, you know, erasing a few things. But, you know, some of it remained. But that was, um, it was a, quite an interesting um, foray into it because it was the first time I had really visited the, the Sea Islands. Mm -hmm. And it was like stepping back in time. So much of that film, you didn't have to make up. It was already there. The history, the people, the community. Uh, so many of the, there were community people who were in the film. They weren't just actors, yeah. they were people from the islands and the, the, the history itself and the landscape. Oh my God, it was so haunting and beautiful and ghost-like and just the presence of centuries mm -hmm. was just unfold right in front of your face. And you know, the, the water, the, you know, the, the legacy of the food you know, the dress, it was all there yeah. and authentic. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, did it have any, it must have impacted your thought process around, I mean, it, it feels like one of your sculptures in the entire, now that I know this, thinking yeah. about the film. Um, yeah. And I mean, obviously, Julie, yeah. that's what she intended. But. Yes. And I think they called me because they'd seen the work. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't, uh, I hadn't worked in film, but you know, that's what I do. Yeah. So that was just part of, and of course, I lived it. I mean, that's, that's what the house looked like and felt like in the country where I grew up. You know, it was my great-grandmother's house and churning butter and milking the cow, all those things. Um, yeah. I can't eat beef today because I look in the <laughs> eyes of a cow. They're like the, the most beautiful eyes in the world. So I don't know. Yeah, and um, I... So Arthur Jaffa is the uh, cinematographer, was the cinematographer for um, Daughters of the Dust, Julie Dash's film, and is a person that I've collaborated with. We have a piece actually in the hip hop show oh, wow. um, now. And it's really interesting, you know, um, I remember when Daughters of the Dust came out and uh, people were saying, oh, this is amazing film, um, you gotta go see it, and, and Julie, you know, was mentioned sort of in tandem mm -hmm. often with AJ. Um, and, you know, and I didn't know that you worked on it at all. And I, uh, you know, I, I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just very um, enlightening when you sort of come upon something and you're like, the quality of this is, 
is very specific. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting. And now that I understand Julie's practice and I understand AJ's practice, I know which parts. And of course, yeah. Gary James Marshall's. Yeah. But I think it's really interesting how much of your practice is really present in that film. Oh, and I think a lot of people don't realize that. Oh, so okay. I'm really grateful to, to know that and yeah. to share and, that. And as I say, Michael Kelly Williams was there, so he was brilliant. You know, he's a painter in New York and functioning. And of course, Carrie James Marshall. And again, when I talk about this network of artists, I mean, we just all met there, you know, to work on this project together. But Carrie James Marshall, I mean, who's more brilliant, right? <laughs> I mean, Very Julie few. Dash, right. <laughs> but, so, and Julian and Julie and AJ were at, um, well, no, uh, AJ was at Howard shortly after yeah, you were there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's um, this continuum, this wonderful cycle. Um, so I put this piece in because, and oh, I don't know if I wore it. Oh, I, was, I wanted to share this. I don't know if you can see this in your set. Oh, um, yeah, <laughs> this is, um, these are shards of Danish pottery that, um, from St. Croix, where my, my husband is from. And um, it's called Cheney, which is a combination of China and money because what the, the, the story behind it is that there were two massive uprisings. Um, um, the first was for liberation for formerly enslaved people and the next one was a labor uprising shortly after that. Um, and you understand the sort of connection to from going from being enslaved to really just enslaved 2.0, <laughs> yeah. sharecropping in some places. Yeah. But um, and one of the prized possessions of the then at that point colonizers were um, uh, people from Denmark, and they were really really obsessed with their pottery, mm -hmm. as many of us are. It's quite beautiful. Um, and the uprising um, were, was led by women. It was called Fireburn, and one of the things that they did was uh, broke into all of the china cabinets and took all of the prized pottery and destroyed it, um, and then threw it into the ocean. And so it washes up, and of course the salt, you know, changes the composition and smooths the edges, and kids would use it and play with it as play money. Um, and then eventually um, people would hunt for it and make it into jewelry, sort of representing yes. um, the, the liberation. And so I was thinking about, first of all, you really early on were working mostly in ceramics. Yes. Is that right? And yeah. that you were particularly interested as well in shards and, and sort of um, the imperfections and the breaking Absolutely. Um, and I think, wait, I think I, I might have written down this quote. I hope I did. Um, ah, someone wrote, and I did, I'm sorry, I did not find out who, um, that those pieces, those broken shards would serve um, as a sort of incantation, you know, with the purpose of bringing forth the benevolence of those that possess them, right? Because you were talking about family mm -hmm. pottery. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, too, about bringing forth the malevolence in this case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but then also the energy um, that was imbued in these pieces when these women stood up and, and, and decided that this would be the symbol for liberation. Mm -hmm. And then again, when artists brought them in and took them up and then started making work mm -hmm. um, in, in sort of contemporary time. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the shards and their pottery. Okay, yeah. Well, shards played a, um, a big role, I guess, in, in my transition from, you know, using clay and other materials. And in ceramics, you know, you're working in clay and you're building things and, my interest was never, well, I won't say never, but it really wasn't so much for uh, functional pottery, but of course we did. But I was much more interested in almost the building-like material of clay and that sort of thing. So that once I was uh, started to fire, you know, objects, and of course the dreaded thing is to open the kiln and somehow it's cracked and it's broken, and this thing, and it's like, boo-hoo. Well, my thing was like, this is fabulous. <laughs> this is fabulous. So I just started to break things, you know? And then when it exploded, it was just fabulous, you know? <laughs> you know, much better than what I'd done. 
So I started to use that and collect it in pieces. And then I started to have children, and they would break everything in sight. And no one ever knew how it happened, right? So there was this accumulation of broken fragments. And I'm joking, but I was really struck with this notion that the thing didn't end. And there's something about, again, the energy of the explosion, of the breakage, that it's an uh, act, right? Mm -hmm. It could be an act of violence. It could be an act of joy. You know, you're just smashing this. You're having a great time, right? right? Um, and that's funny because these pieces were also, um, in the Danish culture, they would, they would break um, the pieces against the wall, I think, for, is it Christmas or? Yeah, Some holiday. many celebrations. Yeah, break which things. is sort of ironic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's just, um, it's wonderful. And then over time, people who knew me just started to, you know, I, I broke my favorite cup and I just couldn't throw <laughs> it away. So I'm putting it here. So in my studio, I started to gather a whole pile of artifacts <laughs> that people would come and just contribute to or broken things and, and, the children would say, oh, I broke something else for you. Here it is. <laughs> right. That we can do. <laughs> that we can do. So the shards become important. And I love that it's fragments of a history. You don't know the full story, but you can see still the beauty, you know, the marks, you know, the thickness of the clay, the glazes themselves, you know, to think about the temperature that was required to melt and fuse the, the clay and the, 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 the glaze. Um, it's a recording, you know, you can read it, you know, mm. you can read them, you can read the shards, you know. I almost found them like, um, almost like letters, brief little mm. notes from the past. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because it's also requires a kind of vulnerability, you know, to give in to that kind of um, tension and breaking. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was thinking about the, that Japanese art where you join, rejoin with the gold and, yes. you know, imperfection is beauty. And, mm -hmm. and um, I know I find that in making images and telling stories as well. I'm not as interested in the perfection, I'm more interested in where things could go and mm -hmm. how they'll tell you what to do in mm -hmm. the end, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's more like, how real life works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I also find as a parent, the more rigid you are, the more things don't really work anyway. <laughs> um, right. So, so it's sort well of a lesson. Smash it all yeah, and just fall. let it all go. <laughs> um, so, speaking of being a parent, that's my artist child sitting there, um, not oh. wanting to leave your piece. Um, <laughs> and I wanted you to talk about these two in particular, one that is. Um, referencing, these are pieces that are actually in the show that you can see here, um, referencing the flag. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the this piece is the, is this the red? Red vote. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just wanted you to talk about them. Honestly, every piece in the show is so intriguing. I would really, I'd want to talk about all of them. But I was particularly interested in this idea of traversing steps um, mm -hmm. of your ancestors. You know, we think about that in a metaphysical sense, but you literally were traversing the same steps and thinking about topography and and materiality from from where he came to to where you are and the parallels. And I'm just I was just wondering about these two in particular. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll start with the one on the. My right, my, the red road of dissemblance. Um, we talked about that it was really retracing or reimagining uh, the journey of Luke Valentine, my uh, fourth great grandfather. Um, and should we say, maybe we should say, because I don't know if everybody knows what, does everyone know what the work is about? Um, maybe you should talk a little bit about oh, that. Luke Valentine. Mm, okay. Uh, well, Luke Valentine was my uh, fourth great grandfather, which we recently discovered had fought in the Revolutionary War. And this was a history that 
my family did not know. I had never heard that before. Uh, my brother, who was kind of the family archivist, he's like the historian, he's always searching, and um, we kind of discovered um, that Luke had testified to receive his pension uh, from fighting in the Revolutionary War, and he testified to the courts in Virginia, um, and his testimony was hand recorded, and so we have like a written document from the courts and signed by his lieutenants that he had, in, in fact, yes, served in the Revolutionary War. In fact, he served two tours in the Revolutionary War. And my family was from Virginia. We lived in the uh, kind of the Piedmont area, the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains there. So he walked from Virginia to North Carolina to fight in the first battle with the British. And he had joined the, he was part of the Virginia line right, the militia from Virginia. So they went to uh, North Carolina, fought the British, and they lost that battle. They lost many troops, over a thousand, they say. And then the survivors, of which Luke was one, thank God, uh, and then he, they walked, they kind of reassembled the few the survivors, and they walked on, on to South Carolina to join the South Carolina line, fought the British again, and won. And then they had to march back, they had prisoners of British and they marched back toward the sea. So my journey, my interest was the topography, which I'm familiar with moving from the kind of Piedmont area to kind of the coastal plains and down to South Carolina. Walking, I wanted to, what was the, not just the topography or the, the land mass that he traveled, but what was the interior landscape of this? He was a free, uh, African man, he was freed, he was not a slave. Uh, so he was drafted, you know, if you were free, if you were a free man, you could be drafted. So he was drafted um, to join. Um, so I, I wanted to interrogate what was the interior landscape of this free African man in the 1700s? What was it? How did he do it? What was it that gave him the strength, the courage, uh, to persevere, to survive, and to cross time and space. Right? And when, with the discovery of Luke, I felt like this was just like mm, time reaching out to grab me in a way, you know. And I had to somehow engage with it. And I just started with the very basics of how to equate in a small way what I do every day of going to the studio hitting a beat, you know, hell or high water, I go to the stu studio to work, to do something. And I wanted to somehow tap into that, the human tenacity to continue to somehow matter in a way. And I tried to do um, comparing, if you will, in a strange mm -hmm. kind of way, mm -hmm. uh, my work and his work then. And I just started with the paintings that's not it's downstairs when you go to see the show, the morning prayer and kind of a nocturnal prayer. And I started using the Voss papers, mm -hmm. like the ancestral papers where you can kind of a wish or a prayer mm -hmm. to the ancestors to somehow invoke the energy. Mm -hmm. And it started to rise. It started to come, you know. And the first thing I always say I heard was his heartbeat, you know, that beat. And I wanted to somehow keep that, that this was a living, breathing mm -hmm. person who did this. And not only did he do it, but thousands of other men did it as well. Um, and it was crossing time. I felt like, you know, we were connecting in ways. Um, so the Red Road, uh, back to this piece, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it was really about, um, the first piece that I did after that was uh, the blue light of home, keep the blue light of home burning. You know, what? whenever you leave home, again, the African proverb, mm -hmm. wherever you go, never forget the way home, you mm -hmm. know? And that um, to start the journey, you first have to have the courage to leave home, you know, mm -hmm. to leave the comfort zone, to leave the known, and absolutely travel into the unknown, and into war, right? So there's no more of a, of a big unknown than war. Uh, so, the red road of disassemblance that I imagined that the road would 
what was his journey. I had to piece it together. So the paintings themselves become cumulative objects. And you can see within uh, the structure, this kind of crossroads, kind of black and white thing that happens and recur, and that, oops, excuse me, recurs throughout the series as a wayfinder that whatever was happening, whatever changes, whatever vicissitudes was happening in his life, that he could find his way back home, that there would be one slightest little inkling of how to make it, you know, which way to go. And as we, you know, transverse our lives, we try to figure out what path should I take? And that's still a contemporary ask, you know, where do we go? How do we go? How will we survive? So with that, I try to, um, with each piece, make the journey a one step closer to his survival of going there, doing what his duty was, and then somehow safely returning home. <laughs> take that, take that in. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I'm gonna go through these again. I wanted to just quickly go through some of the public work because mm -hmm. you know we're not able to see it here. Um, you know, a, lo a lot of times I think there's this imperative, particularly with people of color or with women or people that are, you know, perceived as uh, maligned, um, to you know, make work that that um, is either figurative or linear or that talks about sort of a, a certain kind of activism. And I think it's, it's interesting, you know, that abstract artists have always been able to sort of shrug, I won't say shrug that off, but to um, gracefully manage that. Um, and still hold on to the idea of a distraction, which, um, you know, I, I think about that in terms of my work. I made a piece called As Of A Now, and it wasn't linear, and it wasn't, um, you know, made, it wasn't even, in, it was what they call expanded media. It's not even something that you can put on your television or whatever, but um, the freedom of the imaginary, the freedom of um, identity not being so, um, on the nose, mm -hmm. um, you know, we all work in identity and we all work on things that are obviously connected to our history and the, th and the topical things that we're concerned about. Um, but black people have also often not been given the freedom until, you know, we had the, the, the Norman Lewis's and, you know, other people who mm -hmm. said, you know, we, we think about things in layered and complex and alchemistic ways. So. Um, you know, I thought this piece was really interesting, um, interesting sort of totem to that, literally, yeah, and figuratively. Yeah. I'm interested in like this image, where did it come from? Now, someone has <laughs> taken like the piece and composited, it's very interesting. <laughs> that's, um, just, that's just me putting it, oh, I just wanted to make it so that they could see the detail. Yeah, that's wonderful, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, um, this was called Crossroads and it was, um, commission um, the North Carolina Museum of Art. They have a really pristine sculpture garden. And then um, I think the county donated this kind of wild park-like space beyond. So uh, I was commissioned to kind of create the space between the manicured and the wild. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. <laughs> wild, please. Yes. So. Of course, that's the magic place. Mm -hmm. That's the crossroads, mm -hmm. you know? It's like the trickster. It's where yeah. things happen, you know? It's and where this is called Crossroads Trickster One, right? Yes, it is. Obvious yes, it reference is. to Allegba <laughs> Elegua. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting, as I would do the research, we talked about research earlier, and I visit sites, I'm always struck with my first impression when I visit a site. Mm -hmm. I try to grab onto what it is that I can immediately read or feel from the site. And here it was, um, they had torn down a small, a it was an old prison, right? And then it turned into like a youth center or something. But the original prison, the prisoners made the bricks that, and the bricks were fired and the, of the clay from that whole site and when they tore it down, I had them save every brick. And I drove my, 
tr trusty F-150 down <laughs> to North Carolina and filled it up with those bricks and brought them back to the studio. And with a little rock hammer, you know, you had to, the, again, the action of this thing, of the breaking, we hand chiseled with the rock hammer to open those bricks and to expose this beautiful interior red color. That's the natural color of the mm -hmm. clay. Mm -hmm. And you can see, well, in, in this image, you don't see it, but the, the clay of the earth there in North Carolina is just this vivid, red, beautiful clay. Mm -hmm. So you can feel this thing have grown up. And as we were like unearthing the bricks or breaking them, you could find like little things that had been put in the, some of the pieces, like little metal things or little fragments of things. So again, cumulative history, cumulative energy, and what better? to make the crossroads for the tricksters than pr handmade prison bricks. <laughs> Can't get any better than that, right? And, and I mean, the also the interesting, you know, metaphor over time of prisoners breaking bricks, you know, the, yes. the, the prison coming down yeah. and then you further breaking that and, you know, yeah. the sort of metaphors yeah. for liberation. Yeah. It's, it's and astounding. it was an interesting site because the history, they had documents that it was a site during the... Um, Civil War, you know, where the soldiers and uh, the, you know would camp, and it was a major campground. So the ground would travel from like high ground and then down into a lower area where the the site would be. And another piece that I tried to build before that I couldn't convince them to build that there was a a, a natural cow path because they had to feed the troops from the Civil War, right? So they had all this cattle and the cow. So the cow, you know, cows, if you're in the country, they take the same path mm -hmm. home every day and down. So these cows had etched this kind of ravine down the hill. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that is so extraordinary. I wanted to build like a huge corral at the bottom of it, but they didn't buy it. <laughs> but it was a great that idea. Been nice. It's not too late. <laughs> that would have been incredible. Um. And this is this is the um, is this umbilical piece in the context of the wider show? Uh, yes, that's another um, uh, again part of that uh, ancestors bones uh, exhibition. And you can see on the wall behind the sculpture are all of these um, these are drawings and composite like pieces using the corals and then kind of drawing out. Uh, the ancestors' bones, and using again the um, uh, this stone is this beautiful stone that's kind of um, it's in coal mine fires, and it kind of uh, fires the. It, they almost feel like bark, but it's petrified stone that happens oh. inside coal mines, and I don't know what else to say, but it's just a beautiful. Uh, composite-like stone that I get, and these pieces are fabricated of that material, along with some glass tessera that you can see parts of green and that sort of thing. It's incredible. <laughs> I mean, the 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 conceptual, <laughs> yeah, the conceptual ideas and how you sort of match them uh, with the natural world is just astounding to yeah. me. And, um, and I like going from the tiny little drawing, excuse me, into mm -hmm. the, that the drawing would happen through vines and larger forms, mm -hmm. you know, moving from kind of a micro to you know, the macro space. Um, so. And this, this, this work is a piece, again, it, your, your, your two-dimensional work isn't even two-dimensional, but um, <laughs> this is a piece that's at uh, Anacostia, I believe. Is that right? No, Near the, this this one, is not the river piece. No, no, this is another piece. It's um. Uh, oh, the moon. This is the yeah, moon this piece. This is moon yeah. dance. Yeah, this is part of a uh, a fifty foot mosaic of, of glass and stone that's in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. And yeah, Ooh. there's another part. Anyway, this whole um, the. Um, complex, the developer, he developed this whole unit and he had this idea about the galaxy. So I said, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> so um, uh, I started to think about, you know, this kind of scape, the landscape and moonscape, that sort of things and materials. And 
There it is. <laughs> I think, is, do you have another image of that? Let me see. If I oh, okay. Oh, this is fun. Yeah, this is also this is part of it because this is on the plaza. Now, the first image that you saw, it's much larger, it's like 50 feet, and it just goes on and on with stone and that. But this was the other side of the plaza. So as I was, we were like finishing up the, this piece, they were talking about putting down these awful benches. And I said, oh, <laughs> this was, happened to be on a Friday. So I said, you can't possibly put those hideous benches there. And they said, well, we, you know, you don't have time for another idea. I said, Monday I'll have you some benches. I'm going to design it. So I designed what I call, this is Sun Ra's Intergalactic Street thump, Throne. <laughs> this is just one of them. So it's two of them. And um, they bought it. So I built Sun Ra's Intergalactic Street Throne that you could just come and sit and be part of the universe. Right? I, I feel like Sonny himself yes. made that happen. <laughs> Absolutely. And I have to say, in Philadelphia, I grew yeah. up with Sun Ra. Yes. He, he had uh, a huge Commune, house yeah. <laughs> in Germantown, and I lived in Germantown. I went to Germantown High School. Oh, so okay. all through high school, Sun Ra would be traveling Europe, then they'd all come back to <laughs> Germantown, and it would be on. They would yeah. be playing music out in the yard and all kinds of things. We yeah. won't talk about it. But, <laughs> but it was fantastic, and yeah. I just loved it. And just recently... Sun Ra, uh, um, well, he's dead, yeah. but the leader, he's Marshall, 99. Marshall he was, Allen. Marshall Allen, yeah. he was in Baltimore. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't go, but I streamed it live, yeah. and I had a champagne. Oh, I wish I would have known that. Me and my yeah. friend Sean were just talking about missing that show. Yeah, <laughs> it was fabulous. <laughs> yeah, he's but a, Sun Ra. he would, I mean, this is absolutely the throne that he would have required on, the, on required. the public space. And, absolutely. And it's, it's funny, because he's having this, like, resurgence, and... Um, I grew up, you know, my father opening to his show on WPFW was a Sun Ra record. I, I think I went to see Sun Ra the first time I was maybe seven, and and I had a camera and I took an image of him. I still have it. Oh, fantastic! Um, and um, and a funny, and his last name is Blount. My father liked to remind people that we had the same last name, and he would say we're cousins. Yes. But um, I remember a story of going to. There used to be a big Halloween parade that was way more special back then in New York. Um, mm -hmm. And it was definitely, you know, for you to come and wave your freak flag. And we were there once when I was young, I don't know how old I was, teenager, with my father. And um, com coming down the street were people with, uh, you know, someone on their shoulders with all this regalia and everybody was dressed wild in capes. And I was like, wow, that looks like, you know, Sun Ra. My father's like, that is Sun Ra. That is Sun Ra. <laughs> he was in the parade dressed as himself. But because um, <laughs> when you're Sun Ra, you don't need a costume. You don't need a costume. But, you know, but again, like in costume. speaking to your sort of, you know, I keep calling it the Forrest Gump effect, but that you were there at that moment in history, that commune and what yeah. the, the work that, that it was creating yeah. and. Um, you know, it was such an incredible time and in that they were yeah. accessible, normal people still. Yeah. Um, and he would come down, uh, there was oh, a park a near <laughs> the high school, and he would just, in procession, like you just said in New York, they would just, a whole procession down the <laughs> avenue until they got to the park, and then they would just play for everyone. You know, so it was just open, and yes. the possibilities were open, so... I'm getting the signal to move faster, okay, so I'm faster. gonna move faster. I do wanna hear a little bit, and maybe I'll go through these quickly. Um, I do wanna hear you talk a little bit more about abstraction because it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm really, I always have been really interested in, and again, I think it's something about being free and, not, and living in a place where I was not raced and I was not, you know, I could really get into sort of the intrinsic things that, that that got me going as opposed to, um, you know, being a black person. Everybody's black in D.C., so, you know. Um, not a big deal, right? No, no, that part is not going to get you anywhere. You really had to be, you know, on your game. And so I'm, I'm always attracted to it. And I'm also attracted to the freedom of not being completely legible in a way, you know, yeah. because it, it gives you just an expanse in terms oh. of ideas. So um, this is a piece called Alabama by uh, Norman Lewis. 
and um, and then I started thinking about who I sort of imagined people talking about you in the context of, and and I was, um, you know, I, I started thinking about um, Robert Smithson Smith and and, um, the Jetty. Mm -hmm. and, um, oh, and and the two on the top. I can't. God, now it's her name just went. Somebody help me with the top left. Who is that? Is it? Um, uh, Louis yes, Nuiz Neville, and um, in terms of their interaction, well, his interaction with the with the natural world, and and her in particular in terms of, um, even though it's you know monochromatic, like how she would build and and you know deconstruct and reconstruct, and then I was thinking about who actually you might have been inspired by or looking at, and I Noguchi and of course Sam Gilliam, um, and then. Of course, Howard Dean Howard of Pindell, Dean Pindell, who all is of the above. all of the above. All and I, the yeah, above. I wondered, Absolutely. like, because you also, we, we have a game at home where we talk about um, music from, and we talk about branches and roots. Mm -hmm. So who you came from and then who is sort of coming from your work. Mm -hmm. But all of these people are also somewhat colleagues, collaborators, collaborators, sorry, mm -hmm. um, co-conspirators, um, but also your, 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 um, Colleagues can also be your mentors and, oh, and absolutely. inspiration as well. And so I, I just wanted to hear, and, and I also wanted to just point out to their pioneering conversations around black abstraction, Howard Dina Pindell in particular, oh and what it cost her to kind of push against that in the you know post black arts movement where people were like, you have to be figurative, you have to do a specific kind of work. Mm -hmm. And you know, Jack Whitten, you know, to the point of saying, I have a manifesto about what I'm gonna do and what I'm not gonna do. And I just wonder how these people impact you as an abstract artist. Yeah, first of all, the bravery of all of the, you know, these people. Speaking of risk taking, there we brought it to the topic. Yeah, <laughs> speaking of risk taking, I mean like Howardina Pendale, I mean, my goodness, she just put her foot in it and opened doors for generations, you know. She was, is brilliant and tough, the tenacity, uh, she doesn't give up, and she fought, and she and works fought. in that outrageous scale that you work in as well. Yeah, she's fabulous. And she, um, she started talking about institutions opening up and not being available and all of those things. She, she kicked open a lot of doors. Yeah. And from the inside, I mean, she was at MoMA for- Yeah, she was. Living, living a double life. <laughs> yeah, she was. And, and brilliant and um, gracious. And I have to say, again, the generosity of artists, you know. Howardina Pendell did not have to look at Martha Jackson Jarvis, but she did. From New York City, she would like call, and it would be Betty Sarr, you know, like, we gonna do so-and-so, or Leslie King Hammond, and mm -hmm. Lau Resim. These were magnificent women, you know, who were just, in the field, making their way, uh, making a path for others, and they did. Mm -hmm. So, um, and are still Lowry and yeah. and Leslie are still doing They're that still work doing right it. now. And so is Howardina, mm -hmm. and it's just um, remarkable. A Sam Gilliam, I love him. Mm -hmm. I love a man that's tough to love. He was hard <laughs> to love, and I loved him. And um, brilliant, you know masterful at what he does, you know, just uh, another artist said to me, Yvonne Pickering Carter, um, I was working and, and she says, you know, there isn't any place you could go in painting almost that Sam Gilliam hasn't already been there. And that is so true. Mm. And I love him for the tenacity, but he never settled on the one thing, you know. Right. I don't like the one thing, mm -hmm. unless it's just universal. It's just yeah. so broad that the one that thing is just offshoots. everything. Yeah. And he's managed to do that. And with brilliance, at each yeah. time he delved in, the exploration was just right on the money mm -hmm. and then just on to the next thing. He would just hit the beat, yeah. kind of like a Miles Davis. It just, yeah. just enough, you know? Yeah. And then on to silence or nothing, mm -hmm. you know? And just on to the next thing. Yeah, it, it's a good analogy. That similar sort of curiosity mm -hmm. and and sort of uh, exhausting something, and then going yeah. to the next mm -hmm. thing. 
Um, I also uh, was thinking about you also in the facility in which you oh. move between. This is Mildred. This is wonderful. I know, right? But and like Valerie, um, Valerie my Maynard. good friend, yes, yeah. and also another one teacher started the print workshop at the studio yeah. when was at Howard. Um, how easily uh, she was able to move between sculpture and and two dimensional work and printmaking, mm -hmm. um, and in that tradition, mm -hmm. I'm astounded at, at yeah. how you're able to do that. I was, it's one thing about Valerie Maynard, I remember she came to Howard University, I was still a student there, and I, I always took note when a woman showed up, yeah. and people start quaking in the boots, I'm like, oh, <laughs> she's gonna be really powerful. And she had that presence because she came in and just, she was on her own terms, you know? And um, I, I remember her early on and she impacted me in terms of seeing what women should do. And again, like Lois Maynou Jones. And there were women, but it was mostly men. Yeah. Right? Mostly men. So I had to really pay attention when a woman showed up. And usually when the woman, female shows up, she is really smoking, <laughs> right? Yeah, Valerie, I mean, I miss her so much. Um, yeah. Still waters, you know? Yeah, she was fantastic. And speaking of women, in the same uh, sort of tradition of moving between two-dimensional work and and from abstraction, figurative, and, and between figurative and um, abstraction, yeah. um, Wangeshi Mutu um, is another force. And, and thinking about Wangeshi and um, Leslie Hewitt and Turquasi and and in film, Terrence Nance, um, our mm -hmm. friend and collaborator here in Baltimore. I wonder what you, um, I know that you keep a lot of young energy around and, and I wonder um, what is inspiring you and moving you at the moment across any medium, not just um, visual art, you know, music, um, but particularly in people that are able to move across genre, which I think, um, practices like yours and Sam and a few other people have made a lot easier for mm -hmm. people. Yeah, the young people, they're doing all kinds of things. I mean, I'm just struck with the materials and, wow, we have a master sitting right here. <laughs> you. <laughs> you. You know, fantastic artists mm -hmm. uh, doing incredible work, you know, uh, the breath, uh, there's a fearlessness involved that I think the young artists have, and I applaud. Um, I'm um, intrigued that the boundaries have been dissolved. You know, it's almost impossible to talk about one medium, one material. They've dissolved the boundaries. Because what, what we all know is that very few creatives really do one thing or yeah, care right. about one thing. Mm -hmm. And and so now oh. there's a there's this young artist uh, you yeah. might have heard of. <laughs> this is my daughter's work, my youngest daughter, and Gina Saray Jarvis. Remember that name? Oh. You don't remember that I name. mean the work is fierce. Um, yeah. and so Martha doesn't just uh, make art, she makes humans that make <laughs> art. Um, <laughs> And so, her, I mean, her work is incredible. I mean, objectively beautiful and um, and and thoughtful and and you know a, a branch, but but also a completely whole different path. Yeah. And I wondered if you'd be willing to talk about collaborating with yeah a person that you made. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I don't say I made her. She just came on through here. It's um. You know, it's very interesting. And Gina, again, she was the youngest. And I tell you, I would be, okay, we got to get in this truck. I've got to go down to wherever I have to go, and you have to come with me, and we have to be there. And we would get there, and I'm working on some installation, building something. And then Gina would be sleeping under the sculpture, <laughs> beside the sculpture, on top of the sculpture. And then we'd get in the, we'd finish, we'd get in the truck to come back home. She says, you know, I would have done it this way. And she would proceed to tell me how she would have done it or how she would do it. Or if when we go to the museum, she was like, I could do that. And I would just be furious because, she, you know, she even talks about it. Because I said, this really takes a lot. You can't just say you could do it. The thing is, she could do it. And she's an inventor. She has always been, well, the tale was in fourth grade, 
for science she invented solar powered roller skates that work. <laughs> so, and now this is, I mean, it's like cooking up, it's, I call it Dr. Funkenstein <laughs> because it's like the, it's a laboratory. She's, something's boiling, something's curing, and it's hanging from something, it's smelling, <laughs> but it's working. And she has that gift of exploration if you think I work with unusual <laughs> materials, you haven't seen anything yet. So, it, it, you know, she has the energy and it's born, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, at, I, I'm standing back watching where she's gone. You know, she'll go to heights that I will never reach, you know. But that's the next generation, isn't it? Yeah, my friend, and if I look my out friend in the Pierce audience, there's another young artist sitting there who's just... <laughs> My friend so Pierre quiet. says they're here to replace us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, um, my friend Rashida always says, look, we don't fall from the sky. So, you know, clearly um, her exploration skills were honed yeah. and, and, and there was a permission given yeah. and a space given. And, yeah. and um, I guess this last slide I, is, is really a rendering. It's not an image yet, but um, I know sometimes it's, it's much, uh, it's, it's interesting to talk about what we're working on next. Sometimes things that are in motion or we've already done, we're kind of mentally past them. Um, and so this is an upcoming collaboration between you and your daughter, is that yeah. right? Yeah, and Gina and I uh, have designed this. It's for the 11th Street Bridge. Well, you know, in part of, um, in most cities, um, I guess in the 70s, 60s, 70s, they started to build the freeways and mm -hmm. for the most part, they ended up cutting through a lot of the um, black communities uh, and basically kind of cutting it off from the city. So at any rate, this bridge Thanks is now- Robert a, a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Robert Moses. Thanks to Robert Moses. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's now abandoned, but there's a resurgence to kind of rebuild the, the bridge and turn it into this kind of bridge and park way. So we uh, had competed for the project to build uh, the first piece that would uh, combine the community and the bridge. So this was a piece we, we, uh, we called it Sunrise, Sunset. So basically it's a, a series of portals that we wanted the community to be able to move in and out and around. We uh, took energy from the Anacostia River there that it was almost like the, um, the circling of water, you know, if you throw a pebble in it, this kind of uh, circling that would happen, that we wanted to kind of a capillary wave, that's what it's called, a capillary wave, that if you threw a pebble in the water, that it would continue. So we wanted to have this reverberate across the landscape. So this was, um, so this is just a rendering, so we have a lot more work to do, but this is the actual layout. And basically it'll be uh, steel and glass, so we'd like, um, we took some satellite uh, pictures, really, of like nocturnal views of the cityscape and the, the, how it's lit from outer space. And we have this patterning that goes up the walls. These look really thin here, but they should be thicker and hopefully to engage. So it's meant to really have to change as you kind of leave for uh, in the day, entering from the community and then leaving the riverfront in the evening, going back into the community. So the sunrise, sunset. Sunrise, sunset, yes. So we have our work cut out for us, but. When, when is this? This is 2025? 2025, if they keep going, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably 26. There are so many things I wanna ask you. Well, let me, let me um, I wanna close this with the, some of the things from, from the Jack Whitten Manifesto. Um, Three things he says are learn to understand existence is as political, which I, I love that because I've never been able to quite articulate that. I, I always say, look, if I made it, it's black. <laughs> if I made it, it's political because I am, you know? So mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be overtly that. Mm -hmm. And this sort of really is a succinct idea. Yeah. Um, remove the notion of me, but he also says remain true to yourself, which yeah. I sometimes, think of that as a, you know, a polarity, but it, it's not, it's just, it's, it makes sense. Yeah. And um, 
you know, I want to leave you with the last word to sort of, you know, uh, riff on that. And, um, and also just the idea of um, abstraction in general and what it's done for you and what it does for um, the black imaginary. First of all, thank you for thinking I can riff at 70. <laughs> <laughs> your, okay. work, your work is jazz. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I like remove the me because, of course, you know, you, you cannot in many ways, but to me, that just means it's so much broader than uh, you and I personally, but you and I as human beings, you know, as humans, as this, you know, mysterious being, unique thing, people, um, that it's, you know, the, the possibilities are rather endless, and I think Jack Witten's work definitely does that. He, you know, that cumulative energy, he definitely deals with it. And um, the brilliance of removing the me, but at the same time having the courage of a singular person and being that you are enough, y you know, and you have a responsibility, you have a job to do. So I have a job to do. So I'm doing it, you know, and, you know, don't get in the way. So I'm doing it. And then um, I think um, that's the important thing that, you know, for artists or creatives, you know, if I could say anything to young artists, it's just, it's important work, you know, and you have to claim it, you know, and it will constantly feed you. Um, an artist like Jack Whitten, I mean, his notes from the woodshed, if you get the book and just read it, spend time with it, just the personal um, testifying, if you will, you know, that's, I felt like it was so incredible, you know, what mm -hmm. he has shared with the world. Mm -hmm. Personal, yet not a myopic little view, mm -hmm. but really a world, a universal view and how he lived his life, you know, to go to a whole nother country and come and, you know, uh, find this one tree and the community to embrace him. That's a human event, you know? That wasn't one me man who did that. He's able to communicate in whatever language, whatever continent he's on, because there's a complexity of ideas, and yet there's a unifying thread that can be understood beyond language, beyond personal culture, beyond personal identity. Yeah. You know. Good. We'll leave it with that, I okay. guess. <laughs>
and most of all, ask hard questions and then try to answer it, you know? Yeah, and, I, and for me, it's um, also community. I Possibility for me is, is real because um, I'm a Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really stubborn. It's got to get done. Once, once, it's, once it's in my mind and, Never you know, done. yeah, no matter how long, I don't really think about time or age. I'm a person of a big age yeah. now, and I still mm -hmm. think everything is possible um, because it is. And, and a big, big, big part of that for me is that I've watched people get over humps and get things done. Mm -hmm. And then my community of artists and friends um, continue to do that as well and remind me and then and support me in doing that. So it's important um, for me that, that I'm in that kind of critical mass of other people who believe in possibility as well. Yeah. And I don't count time. I mean, oftentimes people ask, well, how long did it take you to do this? I never count that. I said I would have to just shoot myself if I did. So I just keep it moving. You know, it's, it's um, there's a momentum that happens. Forward. Yeah, forward thinking, forward thinking, and forward movement. Thank you. <laughs>